recording have started I go back to office uh, let's play the PowerPoint slides so as you can see there is some lag I'm playing the PowerPoint through online application so that there, there is some lag but let's wait I have no other options I don't have Microsoft Office installed in this computer and unfortunately Microsoft Office applications they are not free SKU is not providing them to, to us free for the faculty members at least I believe they provide them to the students freely but not to the faculty members mm, let's wait good what happened I couldn't play it mm, today I'm seeing that there is a big lag Let's see how it goes. Good. So, could you say something to confirm that I'm in good shape? Can you listen to me? Yes, Dr. Thanks. Is the screen clear to you? the presentation is clear that's perfect so let's move on so for today we'll discuss something very special that's uh, something close to me because this is my specialization I'm somehow a seismologist I did seismic studies in my PhD and uh, when I was doing my uh, undergraduate level I'm most interested on seismic techniques my master degree was also on seismology and more focused on petroleum geophysics and in petroleum we most often use seismic technique in my PhD I also worked on micro seismic studies micro seismic are somehow similar to what we call earthquake but uh, they are small in magnitudes the only difference between large earthquakes and micro micro earthquakes micro seismic is the magnitude other than that, they are quite similar. So, what are the topics we'll discuss? What are waves? Because seismic energy travels as seismic waves. Uh, we'll discuss what are different types of waves, how they travel, what is a ray, and what is a pulse, how we can generate these waves, and what are the tools which can be used to detect seismic waves. We'll discuss also a ray path how seismic waves travel in the interior of the earth we will uh, will uh, study something called Snell's law that's the governing law that uh, determines how seismic waves behaves or seismic rays behaves once they hit an interface between two different layers we'll talk about different wave types um, some of those wave types are P wave the other one is S wave and finally surface waves and we use actually these wave or seismologists use these wave types to determine what is the internal structure of the earth finally if we get enough time for today we'll discuss something called seismic phases and travel times so basically a wave is a vibration or a disturbance in a medium that is generated from a point, a point of disturbance. And that disturbance travels in every direction. And it travels with a specific speed. So waves usually can be quantified basically in two parameters. We can say what its speed is and also what direction it travels. Waves can be generated in different mediums. It itself can generate waves, water waves, where 
there could be waves in water columns. A spring, if I shake a spring, uh, it generates waves. The wave propagate in a certain direction with a certain speed, and so on. And wave, basically, in the context of Earth, is an energy. It's an energy that's traveling outward from the, from the source point or from the point it originates. And one way to generate a wave on the Earth's surface is to hit it, to make a blast, to detonate, for example, a dynamite or an earthquake can generate waves. And those energy, for example, are manifested as destruction, are uh, earthquakes, a uh, vibration of the surface of the earth. They are traveling away from a certain point. A human can generate waves, for example, by hitting the ground. And simple source or simple type of equipment we can use to generate seismic waves is basically a sledgehammer, a hammer hit on the surface of the ground. And they travel with a specific speed and specific direction. Usually, whenever they don't encounter any change in the rock properties, they will travel in straight direction. However, if there is a change in the physical properties of the medium, as is the case with light, they will deflect. So uh, what you see in the upper right figure, there is a source, a point source, generating waves. The waves is traveling in every direction, spherically away from the source point. And we observe that there is a deflection. The red dashed line shows the deflection direction. Why there is a deflection? The deflection is there because those two medium are of different physical properties. They have different physical properties. One another interesting factor when we study waves is that we should not consider that the particle itself is moving from one point to another point. Particles within the rock or sand particle in, in a block of rock it never ever travels, but what's traveling is the momentum or is the energy itself. The energy is generated by the shaking, by the vibrations of the, of the particles. Particles are pushing against each other. So that pushing is manifested or characterized as a movement of a wave from one point to another point. Uh, so, if you have an eye or uh, keep an eye on a simple particle, that black dot you see where mouse is, keep your eye on that specific particle. You will find that it's not moving from one point to another point. It's stationary. It's vibrating. The vibration is the thing that lets the energy travels from one point to another point. And we can see that the energy in this, at least this figure, have a specific direction. The direction of energy travel is from right to left. That's how the energy is traveling. And this is actually one of the wave types in geophysics. And uh, we can characterize wave types by the particle motion direction. What is the orientation? of particle motion direction with respect to the overall wave propagation direction. So, in this specific case, I can tell the, that the wave is traveling from the right to left. So, uh, from left to right. That's the wave that or propagation direction. General propagation direction of the wave. However, the particle is also moving right and left. So this can be considered as one wave type, one geophysical wave type. There are other wave types where the particle motion is moving up and down, whereas the propagation direction of the wave is from, for example, left to right. 
that's and um, that can be considered as a different wave type geophysical wave type we'll study we'll study them in more detail soon but this figure just gives you an uh, an idea how we can categorize wave types so let's move to the next slides a uh, bit laggy i have to click many times so here we see a spring and also we see a rope the next uh, figure down the animation you see is uh, almost like a rope and the particle motion is totally different in these two cases for the case a for the upper animation we see that the spring is moving as contraction and dilatation a contraction the the uh, the rings of the springs are contracted together pushed together that's a contraction the contraction is usually followed by a dilatation whereas in the other case we see the wave or the particle are moving up and down there is no contraction and dilatation however the waves are traveling up and the particle motion is up and down in both of these cases however the wave is traveling from left to right and if we have a good camera that takes snapshots many snapshots uh, that's how we can tell at what direction the wave travels so uh, for the upper figure if we take let's assume six different snapshots at different times we see that the contraction followed by a dilatation then another contraction are moving from left to right the wave have moved a certain distance from here to here at certain distance in a certain amount of time that determines the speed of the wave the speed of the wave can be determined basically knowing how much a contraction or a pulse traveled a certain distance in a certain time or certain unit of time that the same thing is applicable to the room we see that there is a one wavelength or a what we call a trough followed by a peak trough and a peak at certain snapshots this wave train is moving from left to right the speed at which it moves it determines the speed of the wave train we were talking that it moves with a specific direction and a specific speed so the speed is an important parameters we need to determine because uh, seismic waves travels with different speeds in different rock types and uh, the final objective of a geophysicist is to determine what are the different rock types by basically determining the speed at which waves travels in rocks is it clear so let's discuss some parameters of a wave so what are the interesting parameters we can quantify first of all amplitude amplitude is the maximum height it can reach from a stationary position from a um, zero amplitude so this is a zero dash line is the zero amplitude whereas the crest the highest point it can reach is the highest amplitude usually amplitude is very important it characterizes some important parameter which is the energy the energy of the wavelength or the waves for example if there are two different people hitting the ground one of them hits the ground he generates he or she generates uh, a wavelength of higher amplitude we can consider that the energy each sends he or she sends to the ground is larger compared to someone who sent a lower amplitude so amplitude and energy are proportionally related to each other another thing which is of interest to us is also the crest the crest is somehow related to amplitude but amplitude is varying from one place to another place crest is always the maximum peak 
the maximum peak. So amplitude here is the large, the amplitude at this specific point where the mouse is pointing right now, crest are, uh, and amplitude are, say, are the same, whereas the amplitude is lower, lower, and amplitude is zero here, and the amplitude is negative, and so on. Whereas the crest is always the largest positive value. And the opposite to the crest is the trough, the lowest, the lowest amplitude usually. It characterizes uh, the, what we call uh, the trough. Another interesting parameter is frequency. Frequency is basically how many cycles passes through a certain point in a unit of second or a unit of time. That's what we call frequency. And we can all tell that frequency and wavelength are conversely related to each other. So a uh, period, period is related uh, to frequency. Frequency and periods are usually inverse of each other. But wavelength is what is the distance between successive peaks or successive troughs. Successive crests or successive uh, troughs. That determines the wavelength. If the wavelength is shorter, it means the frequency is higher and vice versa. The final, the final thing which is of interest to us is the velocity. Velocity is the thing we want to determine. If you know the wavelength and the frequency of a waveform, we can easily calculate its velocity. So usually a wavelength is a unit of meter. The wavelength is the unit of meter. The unit of, uh, of calculation of a wavelength is a meter, whereas the unit of frequency is one of a second. So if we multiply them together, uh, the overall, the final unit going to be meter per second, and that's actually the unit of velocity. So this is actually the most fundamental or the first uh, important equation in geophysics. We'll come to many more equations later on in, uh, in later chapter, but this is cons this equation, what you see right now, is considered the basic or the most important equation geophysics study in their uh, uh, curriculum. So velocity is important, that's what we need to determine. And that's what we need to calculate from geophysical uh, or seismological data. How we can generate them? That's a big question. How usually we can generate them? They could be of controlled source or uncontrolled source. Uncontrolled source usually are considered as a passive techniques. And uncontro uh, uncontrolled source are basically earthquakes. Earthquake, we don't have control on them, on them, and usually they are of the largest amplitude. The energy generated from earthquake, they are equivalent to hundreds of atomic bombs or thousands of atomic bombs. An earthquake of, for example, a magnitude eight, it's very, very destructive. Uh, it reaches or it can shake all the earth. Uh, whereas a hammer hit, it barely can make any damage to a nearby building. For uh, engineering applications to determine, for example, how thick is the bedrock, the loose material, the first unconsolidated layer, can be determined using a uh, hammer. Hammer could be the source. However, for oil exploration, either in, on land, onshore, or offshore, we need to use different techniques. We used to use, for example, Viper sizes. Viper sizes is actually an equipment loaded on this truck. The, the thing you see in the middle of this truck is called a Viper size. We'll study Viper sizes in more detail later on. But the, the truck which carries these uh, Viper sizes are called vibrators. This is a vibrator, what you see. And uh, sometimes it's not easy to access a location or a point where you want to make uh, a source. 
So in that instances, uh, it's easier to deploy a detonation, a chargeable detonation like a dynamite. So what you see here is a guy having a full control on when to charge, when to detonate the dynamite. So those are different uh, actually types of sources we can use. As I said, some of them they are passive like earthquakes, but they are very destructive. Their energy is very large. And most, most often what they are doing, they are shaking the ground. They are initiating the turbulences in the ground. We can either Using these, we can either generate displacement, variation in displacement, or variation in velocity. However, it's not easy actually to do change or this uh, uh, variation in displacement in water. In water, you cannot generate variation in velocity. So what we can generate, we generate, uh, we use a different source in, in marine, and that source is actually called Air gun. Air gun is one of the techniques or sources which are used as seismic sources in marine acquisition, marine surveys. So uh, how it works, uh, it's not uh, a subject of this book or this course, uh, but in general, there is a chamber, a farag, we fill this chamber with air, pure air, and we keep compressing the air until it reaches at high pressure. We confine the air under high, high pressure, and we release it suddenly. We release this air, uh, the air from this chamber very suddenly. And that release will generate a change in pressure. So uh, what we call Air guns, they are generating change in pressure, whereas hammer or viper sizes, they are gener generating change either in displacement, movement of rock sample, rock particle, or change in velocity. Velocity is changing. Velocity is different of the uh, rock particles. It's again rock particle. So how actually these waves are generated and how they vary? Why we can't tell that the velocity varies? And what determines the speed of waves in rocks? Actually, it's determined by something called elastic, elasticity, elastic constants. Students who are petroleum engineers in their uh, degree plans or in their curriculum, they study a course called rock mechanics, probably. In that course, they study these modules in much more detail. But in this course, we will have few slides only on what are actually modules. So a uh, human or Anything can generate a force. A force can be measured if we exert it on something. If we make a movement on something, that's how we can quantify the force. And the force can be quantified on a, if it's exerted on somebody, can be quantified or calculated as a stress. We can call it stress. So stress is what? Is a force applied on an area. That's my phone. If I'm compressing it from both sides, so the force is my hand is pushing against the surface of this uh, phone. That's considered as stress. I'm applying a stress. So stress itself can be of different types. If I'm trying to compress it, push it like that, that's uh, called compressional force. If I'm trying to bring it together, that's a compressional force. If I'm trying to pull it apart, that's a tensional force. This is a tensional force. If I'm trying to break it, that's a shear force. This is a shearing force, or this is also shearing force, if I'm trying to move it like that. 
this is a shearing force. Can I make a change, the force I apply to this phone? Can it make a change to the phone? Can I destroy it? Can I bend it? Can I make any change? Yes, probably I can. So the change accompanied by stress is called the strain. So we have a stress and we have also what we call a strain. A stress has a unit. Its unit is Pascal. The, the, so the unit of uh, stress is Pascal. Whereas the change uh, made to a body or anything by a stress is considered or is called as a strain. But it's dimensionless. It has no unit. Because why um, usually the strain can be quantified or calculated as the change. So let's assume that this is the phone. I'm trying to compress it. Or let's say this is a pen, a marker. I'm trying to apply a tensional force. I'm exerting a tensional force on this pen. And I try to extend it farther away. Make it more elongated. So, uh, the strain could be the ex extra elongation I create. Extra elongation I create over the original. The small change over the original. That defines actually the strain. The strain thus is unitless. So, m what is modulus? What are moduluses? Moduluses basically are stress over strain. Stress over strain. So, modulus varies. Varies from one sample to another sample. For example, a rubber, for a rubber, a simple stress, a small stress can make large change, large strain. Whereas for a pen, uh, I need more stress to make small amount of change. So this is, for example, this extensional, extensional force I apply to this pen, trying to elongate it. That's called elastic modulus. That's called elasticity, elastic, elastic modulus. And I'm trying only to extend it apart, make it elongated, make it taller, for example. That's what we call elastic modulus. So elastic modulus varies from one sample to another sample, from one rock to another rock. Some rocks are easy to elongate. Other rock samples are harder. You need more stress to create or make the same amount of strain. Sometimes what happens, if I apply a force, to somebody, to this pen, for example, I find that it start getting bended. Start getting bended. However, when I remove the stress, it will return back to its original shape. It will return back to its original shape. So this is depicted in this graph. Stress in the y-axis, strain in the x-axis, at one regime, we see that the relationship between stress and strain is linear. If I apply stress, there is a change. If I remove it, it goes back. The strain goes back. If I, I remove the spray, stress, the strain remove it back. This region, this region is called elastic region. That region is called elastic region. And we are only in seismology or seismic waves are actually traveling in elastic mediums. Once they are traveling, they are not making permanent change to the rocks. No, they are not making permanent. They are not breaking the rock. They are just traveling. They are shaking the ground and ground will return back to its original state, but the energy travels away. That's what we call elastic. That's the reason seismic waves are called elastic waves. Seismic waves are called what? Elastic waves. <coughs> However, if I apply a stress, 
and I bent the rock or I bent the pen, this is what we call plastic. It's, it's bended, I remove the stress, still the pen has been bented, that's called uh, elastic regime, sorry, plastic regime, not elastic, plastic regime. It has been deformed plastically. When I make up, I, if I exert for the stress, until a point, the pen breaks. That's called brittle, brittle deformation. This is where fractures happen or faults happen. That's the point where earthquakes happen. So earthquakes happen when a brittle deformation happens. At that point, there is a brittle deformation, but away, away from the fault surface, energy is traveling elastically. Away from the fault, after the initiation of the fault, energy is basically traveling, traveling elastically. It's not exerting damage. After the passage of the energy, the rock will return back to its original state. So it's an elastic medium. And seismic waves usually are traveling in elastic mediums. And most of the rocks are, and I'm considering only the elastic, elastic constants, what we call young modulus, and that's young modulus. There are other modulus types. So elastic means <coughs> you can deform it, you can make a change to it, However, that change is removed. It springs back when I remove the stress, when the stress is released. So, for example, let's assume that this is a block of rock. That's the initial state. It has a width of W from both sides. This is W, this is as well W and it has a length of L. So what I do, I exert a force. I exert a force in, on its surface, try to elongate it, push it apart. That's extensional force. This is kind of extensional force. It's not a compressional force. It's an extensional force. What happens to the rock if the force is so high it might slightly get elongated. It might slightly get extended. That extra extension is delta L. It's delta L. So what is the stress in this sense? How I can calculate the stress? Because I'm applying the force on these surfaces. The surface is what W times W. W squared, and what's the force? The force is the thing I, the, the amount of energy I apply. So the stress can be calculated as F over W squared. Force over area, that's a stress. Whereas a strain is delta L, extra elongation over the original shape. Original is L. So what is the modulus in this case, the modulus is stress over strain. This specific kind of modulus is called the young modulus. If you are trying to change or elongate a rock, that's called younger modulus. There are other two important modulus types. One of them is called shear modulus. The other one is called bulk modulus. So we have shear modulus and we have also bulk modulus. Young modulus, again, is what basically you are trying to elongate some material. Or also compress it from two sides, trying to make it shorter. That's also a young modulus, either direction, either you extend it apart or compress it. I have a simple question, quick, quick question. If two, let's assume that these are two different plates, they are colliding, they are colliding with each other. What kind of faults we can expect? Normal fault or reverse fault? 
anyone can answer two block of rocks are colliding with each other they are moving against each other so what kind of force will be generated what kind What's of force the question, Doctor, okay? the question is <clears throat> is that two block or two plates tectonic plates you know tectonic plates Mara? Okay. if they collide with each other what kind of fault you expect normal fault or reverse fault uh, reverse that's true yes so if they are colliding with each other we expect reverse faults if they are moving apart if it's a, a, an extensional force between these two uh, rock bodies it's like what happens in rifting rifting where a new uh, ocean forms there will expect normal faults. So this is Young modulus in general. Uh, there is also shear modulus. Shear modulus is what <coughs> shear modulus can be quantified or characterized whenever it's. I'm not trying to change the shape. Uh, sorry, the volume, but only the shape, the rotation. I'm not changing the volume, the size of a body. I'm not changing the size, but I'm trying to make a rotation. So if I have a block of rock and I want to exert a shear force, try to rotate it, how I can do that? Let's assume that uh, let's have this block or maybe something. Yeah, let's get again the same phone I had. This is the phone. I want to rotate it. I should exert the maximum force in in horizontal direction like that horizontally not vertically that my maximum force should be horizontally until I can make a small a slight angle to it yeah it's hard at least for this phone but you can do that for something else let's say I uh, give a just bring a uh, this is some medications I was taking. So this is also a, a box, a square. So for this simple case, that's how I do it until I create some slight angle. So your lab gonna be on this part. You will be given some uh, samples, and you need to calculate what's young modulus, shear modulus, and also bulk modulus. For this case, for example, what I'm trying to do, I try to create some angle. So the maximum force, the force direction is, is horizontal on the surface. And the surface is what? The surface is W times L. So W times L, that's the surface. And the change I make is that change, theta. And we know, if we don't know what's theta, at w and uh, at least we know what's delta L, we know what's W, theta can be known. Theta is what? Opposite over adjacent. Opposite over adjacent, it gives you theta. Tan theta equals opposite over adjacent. Opposite is delta L, adjacent is W. So that, that's how you quantify what we call shear modulus. Bulk modulus is what? Bulk modulus is basically you try to, to squish something, to make it smaller. You change the volume of something. So volume of water can be changed. Volume, it's easier to compress a water than to compress a rock. So the bulk modulus of rock is larger. You need a larger force to compress a rock of certain amount rather than to compress, for example, water. Bulk modulus of, for example, air is very small. Air is really compressible. Gas is highly compressible. You can put a lot of gas in small area or small volume. 
whereas the rock, you cannot easily compress it. And the bulk modulus then for some rocks is high. It means that you need a lot of force to make small change in volume. However, for water, for liquid, there is no shear. You cannot change the shape or it's very easy to change the shape of the water or liquid. Water can take the space any, of any container. You can put it in any container easily without exerting any force. So shear modulus of water is zero. Is zero. Bulk modulus of water, there is some bulk but it's smaller than the bulk modulus of rock. Rock needs more forces to, to make small change in volume. So bulk modulus is a change in volume. So it's compressibility, P is compressibility, is the force which is equal from all direction, for example, on a, a ball inside water. If I put a ball inside a column of water, the force on the surface of the ball is equal from all directions. Like what you see here. So the force from this direction, this direction, from all direction is the same. And uh, I'm interested on how much compressibility I made, how much change was there in volume, if I'm talking about bulk modulus. So, Having studied these modulus, how they are correlatable to velocities? How they are correlatable to velocity? This is how they are correl correlatable. So, velocities of seismic waves, different waves, is basically what square root, square root of restoring elastic force, restoring modulus, or moduluses, over the density, over the density of the material. For example, there is a velocity, a type of seismic velocity called P wave, VP, which is calculated as such. So it's equal to bulk modulus, that's bulk modulus, K is bulk modulus, or kappa is bulk modulus, kappa plus 4 over 3 shear modulus. This is very important. So mu is shear modulus. Whereas rho, that's the density of the rock. Rho is the density of the rock. There is another <coughs> type of seismic velocity called S wave. S wave. Vs. Vs is calculated as such. Square root of what? Only shear modulus. Only shear modulus divided by the density of the material. Shear modulus of, for example, of any rock over its density. That's how we calculate Vs or Vp. So my question here, <clears throat> what, happens, what happens to the velocity Vs shear velocity or S velocity if I increase the density of the rock? Would the velocity increase or decrease hmm? if I increase the density? Decrease. Yeah, you are almost right, but you are in other practical way you are wrong. Because any change, small change in density actually will make a large change in moduluses, elastic moduluses. So if I make a small increase in density, it will be accompanied by a large increase in mo shear modulus. Yani, either a density is haja basita. الزيادة في الشير مودولوس بيكون كبير. فthis is a question I always repeat 
unfortunately, I repeat it many times, and I find that the students are making the same silly mistakes, either in the final or midterm exams. Density varies slightly, actually. And density, in general, in rocks varies slightly, whereas uh, shear modulus and bulk modulus, they vary considerably. It changes very, very large numbers. So any small change in density actually will make, if you decrease or if you increase, for example, the density slightly, you think the velocity will decrease because it's in the denominator, not the numerator. It's in the denominator. If I increase something in the denominator, the value here will decrease. This will increase, this will decrease. However, if I increase, increase the density, the shear modulus, and also the bulk modulus, they will increase considerably. They will compensate then for the decrease in density. So if, the, uh, sorry, the, the increase in density, if there is an increase in density, if there is an increase in rock density, usually the velocity will also increase in contrary to the equation. Why is that? Because the modulus, rock modulus, will increase a lot by imposing or making a small increase in density. Is that clear? Or shall I repeat? No, not clear. Is it clear? <coughs> no. no. Yes, that density, mm, that density is it. A shear modulus, for example, this equation, or even this, if the density is that, the shear modulus is it, in a larger way, and the bulk modulus is it, in a larger way. So in the end, the increase here. بيسبب هيش زيادة في الفلوسيتي وأصلا بعدين بنعرف يوم بندرس الدنسيتي تكنيك دنسيتي مضات جرافيتي مضات جرافيتي depends on density بنعرف أنه we will learn that density is slightly changing in the rock whereas velocity is changing a lot دكتور yes uh, I know that uh, the velocity when uh, the wave would travel faster and higher uh, rock. Yes. But uh, according to this equation, uh, there is a reverse uh, relationship between uh, the velocity and the density. So, yeah. Um, yeah, but why it's increasing rather than uh, increasing? That's what I said. Yani, if there is a change, large, small change in density, there will be a Accompanied by large change in in moduluses, elastic moduluses. Usually, a rock, a rock sample of higher density, it has high elastic modulus. For example, a loose soil, loose soil. It's a loose soil. Its density is low. So elastic modulus is very, very slow, well, very, very low. Hence, velocity, seismic velocities in general are slow. If the rock is highly consolidated rock, igneous rock, or metamorphic rock, which are usually the highest velocity rocks, they have high density, very high density. Their density is high compared to loose material compared, for example, to sedimentary rocks. Those igneous rocks, they have high or large elastic moduluses. The, yelk, the bulk modulus and shear moduluses are very, very large. Very, very large, very large, big numbers. Numbers like in millions, <laughs> larger than millions probably sometimes. You got the point? Yeah, the question why density is inversely related, it's inversely related, that's true. But a small change in density will create large changes in uh, elastic moduluses. 
young modulus, shear modulus. Young modulus is not considered in here, but it's considered with the other velocity types. We'll not deal with all seismic velocity types. We'll be studying only a few of them. Uh, two important are uh, P and what we call P and S waves. Uh, am I answering your question? Yes, yes, thank you. You're welcome. So what are the wave types? What are the different wave types we consider? Two of the most important wave types are called body waves. Body waves. And we call them body waves because they can travel in the interior of the Earth. They can impinge all the Earth interior. That's the reason we call them body waves. They can travel in the interior of the Earth. So we have P wave. One of them is P wave. The other one is S wave. Those are the two waves we just studied. We just, I just told you what are their equations. They have the simplest equations. P wave and S wave. S wave basically is one of the simplest uh, in terms of equation. Is basically square root, square root of shear modulus divided by the density of the rock. So my question, <clears throat> if I go back, let's go back here. What is the S wave velocity of water. What is the S wave velocity of water? Can I shear a water? And how much can I measure the water? It will, it will be, be zero. zero. It will be zero. No. Yes, that's true. Shear water. Let's let me shear. Shear modulus, or what we call rigidity modulus, rigidity modulus. You cannot shear uh, water. You can shear, you can try to change the rotation of uh, a block of rock, but water can occupy any container. The shear modulus of water, gas, or any liquid, or any fluid is zero. Whereas water has, can be compressed. So it has bulk modulus. It has some bulk modulus. So for water, VP, VP in water is simply what shear modulus becomes zero. Bulk modulus will have some number, becomes kappa over rho. Bulk modulus over density for water. Shear modulus is simply zero in fluid, whatever type of fluid. Back to here. So these are the body waves. Uh, one of them is P wave. The other one is S wave. Uh, P wave, we also call it primary wave. And the reason calling it primary wave, because it's the fastest. It's the first to arrive to a sensor. If I have, let's assume that this is a source. I'm shaking the ground here, whereas here I'm having a sensor. I'm recording uh, the incoming wave, the retaining waves. Uh, so the first energy to arrive, the first type of wave to arrive is the P wave. P wave is the fastest. Why is that? Because the reason how it, the particle moves, how the particle motion is. In that case of P wave, if the wave is traveling, let's say, this direction, straight forward, the particle moves like that. Moves, pushes forward and backward, forward and backward. This is easy movement. For, for someone like me, if I ask me, can I move like that and walk? Yeah, it's easy. So the particle motion, how the particle is moving, is moving back and forth in the direction of wave propagation. As you can see the, in this anim animation. So here the black dot, we assume it as a simple particle. The wave is arriving. It moves the particle, push it forward and backward. That's how the P wave travels. 
However, for the S wave, S wave is actually the second to arrive. It arrives after the P wave. That's the reason they call it secondary, secondary wave. It's not the first wave. Both of them, they can travel in body of the rock, in the interior of the rock, or interior of the earth. So how it travels? It travels side to side like that. And that's, that's it's moving the direction of motion and it's moving side to side. Or it's jumping up and down and moving. So it's vertical direction and that's how the propagation direction, wave propagation direction. Or side to side, horizontal. So this type of movement is a difficult probably for someone. If I ask someone, could you jump and walk? He says, oh, I can't do that, but it's more difficult than trying to move forward and backward and move for, uh, and walk. So if there are two persons, one of them is just moving back and forth and walking, the other person is jumping up and down and walking, who will, go, who will be faster? The first one. The first one because he's just moving back and forth and walking he will be faster than the other one, the one who is jumping up and down and walking. So these are what we call body waves. And we can characterize them or we can recognize them uh, apart from other wave types. They have usually high frequency. They have high frequency and their amplitude is low. They have lower amplitude than their counterparts which we call surface waves. So surface waves, they are also categorized into two categories. One of them is love wave, the other one is Riley wave. So we have love wave and we have Riley wave in, uh, in what we call surface wave. And why they are called also surface wave? What's the reason? Again, because they can only travel on the surface of the air. They cannot go deeper into the interior of the earth. They only travel on the surface. Their amplitude decreases as they go deeper. So we have one of them is uh, love wave. Love wave is the third fastest. So if I sort them, first comes what? P wave, then S wave, then love wave. And finally, Riley wave. And why they are called Love and Riley? Because, by the, because they were discovered by those people. One guy was Love. The name of that guy was Love, who discovered Love Wave a long time ago. And the guy who discovered Riley Wave, he was uh, named, the name of that guy was Riley. So Love Wave, how it travels? Love Wave is quite similar, actually, to S Wave. As you see, it's moving side to side. But the only difference is that the amplitude is decreasing. You see, amplitude is decreasing as we move down. That's what we call love wave. And finally, Riley wave is the slowest wave. It's almost you are ruling along the earth, ruling. You are connected to Chaklab. When you move and you move to Chaklab. So if you ask a person, one person will let him go like this. He will move on the side. He will go on the side. He will go on the side. And the other one will let him go on the side. And the other one will let him go on the side. The other one will be the best one. He will be the slowest one. He will be the slowest one. Because he is, jump, he is ruling along on the surface, so he becomes the slowest person. Compared to, for example, even love wave is quite similar to surf, uh, sorry, uh, S wave. Love wave is quite similar to uh, um, S wave. The only difference is that its amplitude is decreasing as we go deeper. So one way to differentiate them from body waves is that surface waves are of high amplitude. Their energy is large. Amplitude is big means energy is large. However, their frequency is low. 
And whenever there is an earthquake, actually the energy that makes the highest destruction is those surface waves, and particularly Riley wave. Riley wave is responsible actually about the destruction during an earthquake. You know, <clears throat> if you go to YouTube, make some search in YouTube, you will find that some animals, they detect earthquake before it comes. Before the earthquake comes, they will feel that there is an earthquake coming. How is that? Some scientists say that P waves arrive first. P waves arrive with very low energy and we don't feel it sometimes. Humans cannot feel it. However, some animals like dogs or cats, they can feel the P wave. So they feel that there's some shaking is coming. Then after some time, the surface wave will arrive, which are the destructive wave, which are of high amplitude, high energy, very destructive. They will make a lot of devastation to the, to the buildings. And uh, as I said, one way to, correct, to differentiate them is by their either amplitude and frequency. Surface wave, they have higher amplitudes, However, they are characterized with lower frequencies. And how we record them? So what is the tool to record energy? We studied uh, how uh, to generate them, what are the equipment or sources which can be used as source of energy, but how we can record them. The, the recording can be done by using a tool called seismograph. Seismograph is a tool that records earthquakes or seismic energies, or seismic waves. It's called seismograph. Seismograph are categorized into many different categories. Uh, one of them is called seismometer, um, accelerometer, and so on. But the simplest one is Jufun. Jufun are actually the one we have in our department. We don't have seismometers. We, have, we don't have broadband seismometers. They are quite expensive. But a Jew phone, Jew means earth, phone means listening, phone, listen, in Latin words. So we use Jew phones to listen to those variations. And Jew phones, by the way, they are sensitive to change to what? Change in displacement or change in velocity. They can't be used in offshore studies, in marine, because... I cannot generate change in displacement in, inside the water. Uh, how I can measure displacement change inside the water? I can't. So uh, we use something called hydrophone. Hydro means water, hydrology, or some, it means water. Phone, phone. So this is the, the tool we use to measure seismic waves in marine. We cannot use hydrophones to measure S waves. We cannot use them. S wave will not be generated in marine. S wave is zero in marine. There is no S wave. So hydrophones are sensitive to change in pressure. Change in pressure. And the and instruments are actually recording all the wave train, all the shaking. And these are some instruments which are used in all days. They are no further or no not used anymore nowadays in uh, modern technologies. So we have one in uh, one diagram here, schematic A and schematic B. So for case of A, what we have, we have a, a bump, kura kanna, fi qalam, and it's hanging from a rope, and the rope is tied to a frame. The frame is attached to the ground. The frame is firmly attached to the ground. So whenever the ground shakes, it will shake with it the frame. 
So uh, the bulb, because it's hanging, it's stationary, start rotating, start marking. So this will only record horizontal movement. To record vertical movement, we hang the bulb on a spring. If there is a vertical movement on the frame, we need a spring. We attach it to the first spring. And whenever there is a movement of up and down, up and down movement, the spring gets moved, shaking, it will record something. It will record the, the vibration of the ground. There is some drawbacks, and it's, it's easily solved in uh, new techniques, new instruments by using amplifiers or capacitors or other things, but I will not go de into details because that's beyond even my own uh, subject, my own knowledge how actually capacitors work and how they you or create these uh, tools. Uh, the drawback is that if I recorded a passage of energy, an energy arrived to some point, and uh, the spring started oscillating, moving, shaking, Sometimes, if the stiffness of the spring is very low, it will keep shaking forever. And if there is another earthquake happening, I cannot record it, because the, the spring is already shaking. How I can remove it? I use some damping technique. And the damping, usually in new electric, electric circuit, can be done through capacitors. But however, uh, the reason for damping is what? Why we use damping? To let the spring or to let the system stop after some time. Because we recorded the energy, that's, that's fine, that's all. Why we keep letting the, the spring shake forever? No, we want it to stop, we just recorded. We want it to get calm get stationary again, stop shaking, to let, to let the same equipment to record other incoming waves. Maybe another earthquake happened, or another hit I made to the ground. The technique is dumping. For, for example, in this simple case, we float this bulb inside fluid. We make it inside fluid, so it will stop after some time after a while good is it clear shall i move so new techniques um, what they use instead of a, a hanging a bulb they use magnet and coil we have a magnet and the magnet is surrounded by a coil. And as you know from Faraday's laws, uh, what happens if we move a magnet inside a coil? We will induce current. We will induce a current. So this is the configuration, recent configuration of geophones. So geophone is, is having what exactly? It has uh, a magnet, so the magnet can either be surrounded by coil or there is a coil. You see, there is a coil inside the magnet, and the magnet is in inertia. The magnet is shake, is stable. The frame itself, this frame shakes with the ground. Whenever this frame shakes and the coil is moving inside the magnet, it will generate an electric voltage or electric current. The intensity or the amount of that current is proportional to the amount of ground shaking. The larger the ground shakes, the more or the higher the intensity or the amount of current is there. So that's the, the new concept, new techniques, modern uh, geophones, how, this is how they work. 
and they are very, very, very sensitive. They can record even small displacement equal to 10 times of a typical autumn. You know what is an autumn? Autumn cannot be seen unless if you view it under a microscope. So these uh, equipments, geophones, or modern geophones, they are very sensitive, sensitive. They can record displacement as small as 10 times of an autumn. They can detect a person walking one kilometer apart. I remember when I was doing a uh, seismic survey, I was able to record even the noise generated by an airplane. Good. So they can record all the wave types, all the wave types, P wave, S wave, whatever waves are there, they can be recorded. Uh, P, if I'm doing seismic acquisition for oil industry, usually P wave is the in is the signal, is the thing I am interested on. Riley wave, love wave are the noises. They will be recorded. However, there are noises, I want to remove them. My objective is to minimize them, to eliminate them, either during acquisition, the time I do acquisition, or after, after collecting the data, acquiring the data, coming back to office, doing some kind of processing or filtering to remove the unwanted part, which is what? Which is the surface waves. Surface waves are noises usually. However, uh, a type of acquisition called MASWA, there is a type of acquisition called MASWA MA, SW, multi channel surface wave analysis, that's the, what it stands for, that's the acronym. So uh, for that, we are actually recording surface waves. We are trying to detect Riley and Love wave. We are not interested anymore in P wave or S wave. So what's your interest actually, what's uh, the signal and what's the noise, it dependent on what is your target, what's the purpose of the study. So here again, um, that's how the modern Jufun's configuration is. It's based, it's made of a magnet and the magnet is the ease, uh, encapsulating a coil or surrounded by a coil. And usually one, one setup, one such setup is called one sensor. It can record energy in one direction. So it can record energy in one direction. I have a question. Let's assume that this is the sensor. This red marker is the sensor and the energy is arriving from down here and it's an S wave energy. Let's assume that this is an S wave energy <coughs> arriving from below, from some layers below the earth and we know the particle motion direction is perpendicular for the S wave perpendicular to the wave direction. This is how the wave is arriving that's how the wave is arriving. Would this, my question is, would this sensor be able to record the S wave? Yes or no? Sorry? You cannot view it? We cannot see you. You cannot see me? Yes. Really? Oh, that's unfortunate. Okay. Mm, let me see what the problem is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, sorry, that's true. Yeah, I have only one cam. No worries, uh, you can see the record, in the record, uh, everything is fine. My apologies. Uh, 
things gonna be better once I return back to SKU. Uh, from next week onward, I will be lecturing from SQ itself. Uh, I have multiple comms there, and I'm not sure what went wrong with Google. SKU should find the solution to that. Maybe we should move to instead of using Google Meet, we should use uh, what they call it some other application, Microsoft Team or something else. Because at least there I can record. Here I'm not allowed even to record. Um, Google is getting greedy. They're just uh, trying to grab as much money as possible. Yet they are trillion dollar companies. Make things free for education. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, I will explain to myself uh, Mm, at least visually, so you can see this recording later on uh, if you are interested on uh, very quickly. So if the sensor is oriented like that, the way I'm pointing it, and the, the, the P wave is arriving from down below, the particle motion is perpendicular to the direction of wave propagation. Uh, what happens actually is that the sensor cannot record it. The sensor, this sensor can only record if the particle me motion is parallel to the sensor orientation. So to record, to determine what is the wave type, we need three different sensors. And those sensors should be orthogonal to each other, perpendicular to each other, as in the configuration I'm showing in here. <coughs> Pardon me because you cannot see me, but um, I have no other options. Um, my, my, my cam is used in another application. Uh, I try to solve it in next time. So I need three sensors perpendicular to each other. So these sensors will record, one of them will record P wave. The other one will record, for example, or two, two combination will record S wave. So three orthogonal sensors are needed for what reason? To determine what is the type of energy I'm recording and also from what direction the energy is coming. So if a P wave, for example, if this is assumed that these are the sensors, three sensors, if there is a P wave coming from here, which sensor will record it? The green. The green will record it. So I can tell, oh, the, air, the P wave either arrived from here or there. There are two possibilities. So again, in general, uh, three sensors are needed. Uh, then the requirement for three sensors is that we can tell what is the type of wave we are recording based on the particle motion direction and which from which orientation from which direction the wave arrives to the station to the seismic station or seismograph the seismic station usually they comprise three different sensors in earthquake seismology this is a must in studies of earthquakes we need for sure three different sensors However, for exploration geophysics, one sensor is enough. It's enough in a sense that we try to decrease the cost. Yeah, it's better to have three sensors also for exploration geophysics, for oil exploration, but the cost will be tripled. If one sensor costs you one real, three sensors will cost you three reals. And the number of usually geophones in, in uh, exploration geophysics, in exploration for oil, is up, and up in a number of hundreds. There are hundreds number of, of uh, geophones, probably. <coughs> Here what we see, we see a record. This is a record of um, or some earthquake. So my question, what energy here, where my mouse is pointing right now, what do you think is this energy? 
B wave. B wave. That's true. This is P wave. So one characteristic of P wave, as I said, is low amplitude compared to what? What do you think is this wave train here? Where the mouse is highlighting right now? <laughs> huh? That's surface yes. wave. Those are surface waves. So these are of high amplitude. However, their frequency is low. And what do you think is this one? S -wave. That's the S wave. So P waves arrive first. After sometimes S waves arrives. These are surface waves. And finally, it's not necessary. But in earthquake, uh, earthquake is basically what? Uh, a displacement along a fault of, or initiation of a new fault. Reactivation. Maybe there is an old fault got reactivated. A displacement happened on the plane of this fault, on the fault plane, or a new fault initiated. Uh, the initiation was so sudden that it re uh, released huge amount of energy, large amount of energy. Sometimes the, fo the, the fault might not get displaced totally. Some small part of it will stay uh, intact, but it will get displayed after one day, two days from the main shock, from the main earthquake. And those small displ displacement, which happens after two days or three days, we call them aftershock. And that's the reason you see one of a large earthquake happens, and we have seen that, for example, in Turkey, in Iran, uh, the government or the authority will recommend the people to go leave, stay outside the buildings. Why is that? They might expect some aftershocks. They say mm, there might be some aftershocks. So the, after, the one, the energy you see here is called an aftershock. So this is how we display seismic waves. So this is the, the, the y-axis is the amplitude. The x-axis is the time, usually. It's the time from 0 to 70 minutes. <clears throat> but the time, usually, this time, we should reference it. Zero, what zero time? I want a time like it happened on uh, today, 2nd of February, 4 o'clock or three o'clock. That's a time. But zero time is not a time. I need a real time. So how we record them? We record them, usually we record signals as you can see them in the lower figure. So what you see, a green line, and also uh, you see a black and red. There are three different sensors, green, black, red, for example, in one location, one station, three different sensors oriented orthogonal to each other, or probably one sensor in, in such displays. But what we see, we see recording of one hour. From here, complete one hour. This is six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock. You see that? So this is uh, station, this is one sensor, a continuous recording. This red part, what you see here, is a snapshot from here. That's a snapshot exactly from here. You will see that this is a P wave, then comes some aftershock. It's from where you see these small snapshots. So this is... Uh, a continuous recording because in the case of earthquake we will never ever know when an earthquake happens so how I can decide when to record it I can't decide it's better than to keep recording continuously 24 hours seven days without a stop uh, and whenever there is an initiation of an earthquake it will get recorded the time the P wave arrives is not the time if I'm recording at a time, specific time, for example, in where I live, in Sawadi, for example, uh, 
Uh, it arrives, let's say, at 3 o'clock, exactly 3 o'clock, a P wave arrives. That's not the time the earthquake happened. That's the time I recorded it. The time the earthquake happened is probably much earlier. Maybe 20 minutes, half an hour earlier than that. And how fast it travels is dependent on the rock underneath. How fast, what is the velocity of seismic waves in the rocks underneath me? And what is the ray path? What, how the ray traveled from the source to the sensor? What path inside the rock it has taken? So we can plot them in different ways. One of the common plots is a day plot. This is a day plot. Uh, so this is a continuous signal uh, from 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, up until midday, 11 o'clock. Continuous recording uh, from uh, midday and midnight until midday. So these are continuous recording, and we see that, for example, here some earthquake happened. There is a new earthquake happened, some shaking. This is a continuous one-day plot. However, we can plot them in a different plot as well, or called section plot. In section plot, we can plot different sensors. So here, how many sensors you think in this section plot we have? How many sensors are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten different sensors. So my question is, what is this first energy? What is the first shaking? What wave is that? That's the P wave. Yes, then comes S wave somewhere there, then finally surface waves. My question, another question I ask, which sensor you think is closest to the earthquake location? The one to the left or the one to the right? Which one is... <laughs> Sorry again. One to the... Which one is this? One to the left. That's true. The one to the left. This one is actually closest because... The energy arrived earlier, and there is very short difference in time. This is time between P arrival and surface wave arrival. This delta, the time difference between P and various arrivals will, will increase the farther the source is away from where uh, the sensor is. Good? Yes. Um, we will tend to the previous slide, yeah. Uh, does those uh, sensors are recording uh, the same uh, earthquake? Not necessarily, yeah. This is a good question. Um, mm, yeah. Because if yeah. they are recording, if they are recording the same, uh, the amplitude should have been higher on this one. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. That's, That's true. Why, um, yes, good question. I so, got asked the same question. So, yeah, yeah so, so we, we should, should know, know uh, for which earth okay, yeah. uh, may detect, detect uh, the first arrival. Yes, uh, yeah. yes, if they are, we assume right now they are recording the same earthquake, but the amplitude will differ for many reasons. Yani even, for example, even if there is a sensor farther away from the source, it can have higher amplitude than the one closer to the source. For reasons that, because it's on, a, on some rock which are denser, harder rock. Whereas some sensor is on a soft material, the energy will get attenuated, decay. The energy decay very quickly. So it depends on also the, the passage of the wave, how it traveled from the source to the sensor. 
did it travel in hard rock? If yes, it will retain its energy. It will retain its amplitude. However, if it traveled in loose material to some sensor, it will lose its energy. The energy will decay faster in loose material, in, in a rock which is not consolidated. It's not hard. Is that clear? So uh, I think we will stop here. That's enough for today because uh, it's boring if you are not being able to see me at least. Uh, unfortunately, things are becoming uh, every time more difficult, I see at least in terms of recording. Um, the internet is very slow in here. I'm using my mobile data and still I'm having some lagging. And I can't use my, my camera because I'm using it here. You see here? So at least uh, um, I got the recording. Let me stop the recording.